Biobalance HealthCast episode 229, Testosterone Replacement is Best Administered via Subcutaneous Pellets. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. I am Brett Newcomb and this is Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin and I have written a book called The Secret Female Hormone. It was published a year ago in March in six countries. Uh, as a result of that book coming out, Dr. Maupin was asked to give a talk to physicians at an international medical conference in Orlando in April of last year. We are taking the video of that talk and breaking it down in several podcasts uh, because in the talk, her goal and her focus was to explain to other doctors who don't know this information or who have uh, not accepted the validity of this information and to ask them to reconsider, to look at the information, the research, and so on. What we're hoping in these conversations to do is to give you, the general public, similar information and explanations so that you can take that to your physician and investigate whether or not these are issues from which you suffer and for which these treatments would be beneficial. It should always be your decision with your physician to seek the kind of medical care that will enhance the quality of your life, and particularly as you age. So this week, we're going to be talking about why the methodology that Dr. Maupin uses uh, in her practice is the one that she uses, what alternatives there are, and why she doesn't use those alternatives. So we're going to look at a clip first where she discusses that, then we'll come back and talk about it. I use subcutaneous pellets, but a lot of people use other types of, of creams, gels, buckle tablets. depends on your pharmacy and how good they are, and most, most patients may want to choose. I mean, I just like to use the pellets because it's very low risk in terms of phone calls and it's, it's low risk in terms of dangers of them imagining they've got something. I know what they're getting. I'm putting it in. I don't have to think maybe they put on 10 times as much or maybe they took 10 times as much, so I'm in control of that. So yeah, maybe I have a control issue. But it makes it easier to answer phone calls when you know exactly what hormone they got when, and how long it's supposed to last, and what their last blood test was. And I think that the, the lab tests are much more relevant when you're doing pellets. Sometimes I do lab tests on batch tabs, and they're like a 1,000. The patient still doesn't feel well, and her symptoms aren't better. So I don't even know how to, I don't have, know how to evaluate that. So for me, and I'm saying for me, you guys have your own uh, opinions on this. This is why I do pellets. It's much easier to manage for me. And... It seems to have a much better outcome for the patient. They feel really much better and within four weeks. As you can see, my preference after using every other form mm -hmm. of testosterone is subcutaneous testosterone pellets. Mm -hmm. And my preference is built on years of experience. I mean, I've used creams, gels, vag tabs, rectal suppositories. I've used buckle um, lozenges. Buckle of, is something you put in your cheek. Buckle is something you put in your cheek and sublingual under the tongue of all these delivery systems for right. testosterone. And I have never in those systems gotten full relief for everything. The only thing that has given my patients and me full relief and an amazing, an amazing outcome is subcutaneous pellets, and that Which are delivery system. They're all the, all the things I was talking about were bioidentical. Uh huh. Okay, but it's the delivery system that truly matters. And so when you see something that says testosterone does blah blah blah, right? You have to look and see how it was given, especially if it's a negative article. If it was given orally, OMG, that's terrible. Because if it goes through your liver, it can cause liver tumors. We don't give testosterone orally. That's just in so the, you the avoid drug, that issue altogether. The drug that did do that for a while mm -hmm. was taken off the market. Okay. So, and and was not bioidentical. So the fact is, is how you get your testosterone is primary to how you will feel later and that does require finding the right doctor and finding someone who will use testosterone pellets 
So in my experience, in my research, and after, I mean, I did I did the other forums for 20 years. Well, we talked about I book know about- none of none of those bring people back to health like sub, subcutaneous pellets. Pellets. We we talk in the book reasons for this. You know, when when you have to swallow a pill uh, and it goes into your stomach, it has to be metabolically broken down before it can get into the blood. Goes into the and, liver, and broken down, first pass and effect, and could, then it becomes estrogen. And then we talked about creams. Uh, being externally uh, applied where there are concerns and issues about mess and comfort and dosage and, and how you get the, a consistent amount absorbed by rubbing it on your skin. It, it's dissolved so fast in your system and taken up so fast in your system that it does this. Yeah. And so all day you're feeling up, down, up, down. I mean, that's not a so, good way to so feel. So you monitor yourself, take a break, go in, apply the cream, come back out, and you're ready to go. But... It's but gone it in last. a few hours. Yeah, right. So even vaginal creams, there's a uh, some protocol that I can't believe women actually will do this. That it com- they come in and they lay out all these syringes and all these different orders, and all day long you're supposed to be putting different squirts of progesterone, testosterone, estrogen, and and other things into your vagina. Just like a chemistry lab that you have right. to carry with but you. Who, who has, I don't have time to do that. Who would do that? Plus, they don't feel good. So they're coming to me because they, they have done all the work. Yeah. They've worked really hard at following these protocols, and, and they feel terrible. So they come right. to me, and then... It's a lot easier to get a pellet the last four months or six months. Well, yeah, because then you, you don't have to think about it anymore. You put that pellet under the skin, and the blood circulates. And as your body needs testosterone, it metabolizes what it needs from those pellets, and that's why they last mm-hmm. for that duration. Mm-hmm. So it's an on-demand supply system. Right. It, it's a little bit. It's not as good as God made. Right. God made a system where your pituitary sent a message to your ovary. Your ovary then made estrogen and testosterone. And then when you had enough, it sent a message back to your brain to shut it off. We don't have that with pellets. God was much better at this, but we have the next best thing. Your body's uh, circulation is what determines right. whether your you activity get Activity level. Yeah. Met- metabolic rates, all those things. So... Listening to this, that's a pretty compelling argument. Listening, of course, listening to all of the previous podcasts mm-hmm. where, where we discussed this. But oftentimes people will hear these things and say, well, yeah, that sounds interesting. That makes sense. But I am afraid of needles. Or I, you know, I mean, they, they talk about their rationale for not accepting this as a treatment. Mm-hmm. So, so let's look at what you had to say to the physicians about the logic of these arguments mm-hmm. that you hear from patients or family members or doctors when, when you, they are asked to consider this treatment. Okay. So the logic for patients not taking testosterone is not logical because they say, I don't, I don't want to put anything in my body. Okay, well, you use aspirin, you take you, you get a flu shot. You, I mean, everything you do nowadays is something in your body, plus they're drinking uh, soda with, you know, <laughs> out of a plastic cup. I mean, that's not, a logical expl- that's not a logical argument. So some people aren't going to listen, but I just say, you know, it's going to improve your health. It's going to make you feel better, and your husband will be a lot happier, and you'll be a lot happier. So... That's, that's kind of how I explain it at my office, and sometimes I get through and sometimes I don't. So, Kathy, you say that the arguments that these people make to convince themselves or justify their decision-making process don't always stack up logically. Uh, yeah, logic that's not logical. Because you point out inconsistencies. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. You know, I'm a tree hugger. I'm a purist. I don't, I don't <laughs> eat or drink these things. I don't, you know, eat animal food, whatever. But I'll drink out of a plastic cup, mm-hmm. uh, or I will. I'll drink soda. Right. Or I'll uh, eat at McDonald's. Right. Or it's I'll feed it's my fast. children at McDonald's. Yes, because they or have young I'll, metabolisms. Yes, and yeah. Well, still, it's all all the contamination and all all, all of our contaminant. Contaminants and heavy metals are stored in our fat. Right. More fat we get, the more contaminated we are. Oh, and the bigger bag we can carry around. The more animal fat we eat. Yeah. I'm 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 a carnivore, but I 
take all the fat off of the food. You're I a eat. fat-free carnivore. Yes, <laughs> because that's where all of the toxins are. Mm-hmm. And people are stored in their fat. They're stored as well. in their fat, and then we. Right. So you eat a. Well, you know they're tree huggers, but they're not vegans, and then they're eating all of this animal fat. Uh-huh. And I'm not saying that it's better to be vegan because I don't believe that it is. You need animal tissue. Yeah. That's how we were built. But you have to get the fat off, or, or you're just and and for your children so that they're not getting. The toxins from the animal that they just had dinner for with. <laughs> so it's a, it's essential for them to eat purely, and nobody I know actually eats purely. And then we go to wine. Wine has all kinds of contaminants in it mm-hmm. that you can't even imagine. So in addition to sugar. In addition to sugar. Yeah. So so you may think that you're clean. There's not very many people out there that are actually are, and uh, testosterone doesn't make you dirty or less normal. It just gives you back what you had before. You made testosterone, we're giving it back to you in the purest form that we have, and it is made from vegetables, but it is actually pure testosterone, and it dissolves all the way so that you don't even have to deal with taking a pellet case out, like with Norplant. That was that was difficult to take those out. This just goes in and dissolves. And by the next treatment, you get the other side of the hip. And when that's dissolved, you go back to the first one. So you just rotate sides. Right. And it's in our fat. That's how it dissolves. Mm-hmm. But it's not causing any contamination. It's not a toxic ingredient in no, our fat. There is no toxic ingredient in that. Okay. And it is sterile and it is made by specific pharmacies that I have confidence in. And it is essential that I know what pharmacies make them. I will not buy pellets from, from just any source. Right. I have to make sure I've used the same pellet uh, provider which you, for, which for the again whole time. Makes the message to you, uh, dear viewer, <laughs> makes the message to you. This is about you and your physician evaluating these arguments, evaluating these concerns, looking at the research, looking at the information. This is not just a sales pitch. You know, we're trying to provide you with useful information to make good medical care decisions for your life and the lives of those that you love. So the logic that Kathy's been discussing that she hears in her office sometimes for saying, well, that's all very interesting and it sounds really, really good, but I don't think that I'm a good candidate for that because uh, sometimes... Hardly anybody says that. But that's okay. That By the time well. they get through the process of... I screen all my patients before I see them. So my, my practice is very selective. I do not see... Young men with normal testosterone. I do not you see. Pre-screen everything. I don't see bodybuilders. I don't. I mean, this is not my practice. Right. My practice has to do with age-related testosterone uh, deficiency in both men and women. It also has to do with peop- young men who have genetic defects that make them unable to make testosterone, or at least enough. And I do treat them because no one else will. They will not treat them appropriately. And I see these men who have Kleinfelter's syndrome or or another genetic abnormality right. syndrome get better. They're awesome. But And there are some women who need that as well, like Noonan syndrome. Noonan syndrome are uh, tiny little girls that don't appear to um, mature, and their ovaries are, very, are just streaks. Mm. And so they need their estrogen and their testosterone back. So I will treat those young women too, or right. women who have had their hysterectomies early on, like at 20 or, I mean, I have a 20, I guess she's now 29, but she was 25 when she came to me. Wow. And she had her ovaries out for, for a reason that isn't important, but she needs testosterone and estrogen, and she feels fine now. So, so where I would like to end this conversation is one of the places where we began which has to do with the regulatory environment or envelope in which you live and work. And that has to do with the FDA and the DEA and the state regulatory agencies, all of the people that are trying to supervise this process or regulate this process for different agendas, different reasons. And you're trying to navigate your way through all those agendas so that you can treat real people with real problems and help them get better. 
in the optimal way. In the optimal and way. Every, and, and many of those agencies make it next to impossible yeah. to treat patients the way they should be treated and treat patients efficiently. I mean, some of these, some of the rules are like make it impossible to treat a patient at one visit. Mm-hmm. You have to make them keep coming back. Well, it's not efficient. That's not it's efficient not for them. It's not good for them to have to leave their work two times in a month. I mean, some of these things we are trying to work with and trying to work it out. Mm-hmm. But uh, it, but because testosterone is considered, let me say considered, a, <laughs> a controlled substance, meaning it's dangerous, mm-hmm. how can a hormone be dangerous? Well, because of the abuse of athletes and others who are trying but to be bodybuilders. They still get it. They get it from Eastern Europe. They, and and they get it. It's contaminated. Right. And they get and and no doctor in their right mind is going to treat those kids. Right. So, you know, that's that is it's not dangerous in itself. Like, if I gave you fifty Percocet and you right. are de- depressed, depressed and right. and you took them all, that's it's not that. And I'm controlling. And I'm tr- controlling the um, distribution of this and putting it in a place where they can't share it. Right. And they can't get it sold. Like taking it home and putting it in the glove box and having it sit out in 90 degree weather or putting it somewhere where some kid could get it. Yeah, I mean, a lot of drugs it. are, uh, yeah, of are stolen. Of course, because these are concerns that you share with all the people that you talk to. But in talking to the doctors who already have some knowledge about the way the FDA works, you, you had. A modified statement. So let's look at that. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then we'll come back. We must get FDA approval for some testosterone for us to get payment for our bioidentical testosterone. Um, We have to change the societal beliefs about women over 40. We're not all crazy. We're not all hot flashing and non-productive. We're not all fat. You know, we actually are productive human beings in society, and they need to treat us like that. And that's something that only we can do in this room by having discussions with our patients and women also must get over their fear of everything that shows up in the newspaper. And I know you all deal with that every day. People bringing in articles, look at this, it's scary, this is scary. And we've heard this weekend or this conference all about uh, headlines that are wrong and the, all of the information is wrong, but it's still a headline in JAMA. So we have to counteract that or we're not going to get anywhere. Okay, Kathy, in, in closing, I would appreciate if you'd spend a minute talking about the difference between FDA-approved and off-label usage, mm-hmm. especially as that applies to using testosterone to treat women. Okay, so the FDA approves drugs for a certain purpose. Okay, that means it, that drug has gone through an extensive process and tested on people with the only outcome that they're looking for is was a resolution of this mm-hmm. illness. Now, you and I and everybody knows that some drugs can be used for many different uses. Okay? So doctors have been using FDA approved drugs for other uses than they're approved for for many years. One of the things that's that may be obvious to uh, our listeners is the Topamax. Topamax is a drug that um, is meant for seizures. Okay. However, it was drastically effective to prevent migraines. So for years and years and years, people have been using Doctors have been prescribing Topamax for migraines, even in children. Even though Off-label, that's not what the FDA says it's for. Right. They say it's for seizures. So they did. They have now Changed. done studies and approved it for migraines. But would that have ever happened had everyone else not used this off-label? Right. Doctors are scientists. We're pharmacologists. We understand how different drugs are working. Mm-hmm. Part of what I do is look at the physiology of the human being, not just every study that comes out, but put them together and look at the physiology and then look at the pharmacology and put that together. Okay? So I use things off-label. It's not illegal. Every doctor does it even if they say they don't because they don't even know they're using it off-label. The drug terbutaline is a drug only for asthma. 
It's only approved by the FDA for asthma, and we've used it in the OBGYN community to stop labor. Early labor. Early labor. Yeah. Stop early labor or preterm labor. And we, have, we also use it in men when they have priapism after the use of Viagra to stop the priapism. For those four-hour erections yeah, that you're not supposed the, to have. Yeah, the yeah. greater than four-hour erections. So it works. It works for both. It has the same side effects as it would if it was it was working for asthma, mm-hmm. but we're using it for another purpose for which there is no other drug. Right, and it's legal for you to do that. Absolutely, you are trained to do that, there's whether it's nothing, controlled or not. There's I'm nothing trained illegal to do that, about it. I have a controlled, I have a license to give controlled substances. Right, and that's I, that's given to me by the DEA and the BNDD, and and so. There is no restriction of doctors for using drugs off-label. There's just a reality that must be faced about risks and about making sure that even if you're using it off-label, you're following the regulatory yeah. uh, methodologies. Which is another imposed. problem because they don't know exactly what pellets are or how, how we do it. It's not like a one-size-fits-all. Hi, come on in. Have a pill. See ya. Yeah. It's not that. It's, it is a, I have to figure out your dose. I have to read your, or know your lab, know your history, and talk to you to figure out your dose. And then, then I should be able to treat you. Right. But, but they put roadblocks. They put roadblocks in that because for some reason, they're not happy about some women getting testosterone or anybody getting testosterone and they're and and they want well you say for some reason we have opinions about what yes, those we have opinions. are we've done other podcasts about that we'd like to close by reminding you though that we're not selling anything but books we're giving away information we <laughs> hope that you buy our books and that you buy our books for your physician uh, so that together the two of you can discuss your health care as you age for optimal effect and outcome for your quality of life thank you for listening thank you Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.